So, John Hall defines the shaman as the master of polyphasia. Here's the Amazonian shaman leading <clears throat> participants in the ayahuasca ceremony. There's the pot of ayahuasca brew. And as this psychoactive um, brew takes hold, you can see these layers of reality are opening up in the Amazon jungle to the participants. And the shaman is the master of polyphasia, meaning the master of these uh, different modes of reality. The shaman is the one who can traverse the boundary from, you know, regular physical jungle reality to these weirder realities and the contact with the entities who inhabit these realities. So this is, I, I mean, there are many things the shaman is and does, and it's, it's, it's a useful though vague concept, but I, I like Hall's essentializing of the shaman to this, uh, this master of polyphasia. Many of the things we associate with the shaman figure can, can be fit into this, this definition. This is a painting, by the way, actually uh, um, made by an Amazonian ayahuasca shaman. So uh, polyphasia would be uh, contrasted with monophasia. This is a picture, sort of maybe a caricature, <laughs> a, a real caricature of the monophasic, you know, uh, media saturated post-war uh, popular culture. Uh, these are, I mean, these are people watching a 3D film and entranced and let them be, but um, it's, 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 as it turns out, a nice image of uh, a fear we perhaps have that, that we've lost, lost something in, you know, the, the, this globalizing technologic culture that there's a unifying taking place and a solidifying of the boundaries between our way of seeing things and other uh, possible or uh, older forgotten ways. Um, now, <clears throat> as a sort of flip side portrait of this anxiety, here's a portrait of, I mean, this is the kind of picture you get if you Google multiculturalism. And uh, this is, I think, a folkish, uh, b um, happy picture of mul the multicultural society, which is, you know, the way we define ourselves in Canada. And increasingly, it's it's the definition of, of cosmopolitan modern life, um, a, a, a harmonious diversity. And, uh, you know, when, when people keep telling themselves something, you have to wonder if there's an anxiety uh, driving that rep repetition and, and our insistence that we're a multicultural society is, is many things, but it's, I mean, it's partly a reality, but it's par partly also, I think, again, the flip side of um, our recognition that we're sort of like this, too. You know, we're tweeting Borgian uh, technophiles and so we keep telling ourselves no we're a, we're a, we're a, we're a diverse urban reality that lets in many many different ways of being but you can see in this portrait the many ways of being get reduced to differences of mm, coiffure and literal color they're all facing the same way just as they are in this in this picture uh, the shaman is is the master of polyphasia and i don't think it's a modern tendency i think it's a tendency of consciousness to maybe seek unity in its environment and the shaman is the one who uh, sometimes gently sometimes maybe more forcefully and painfully navigates our contact with with the stranger realms Okay, here's a timeline. No, it's a vertical timeline, meaning this down here we have the past and we're moving up into the present. So this is now. Here's 500 years ago. Here's 2,500 years ago. 2,500 years ago will take to be roughly the, uh, you know, the height of Athenian um, genius and civilization. And what historians used to call the Renaissance, I think there's been some 
critical distancing from this term, but the, the the Renaissance, if you know your French, you can see that means the rebirth. And the Renaissance was what happened around 500 years ago, around um, 2,000 years after Plato's Athens. It was the rebirth of Athenian genius in modern, relatively modern European soil. So it's the rediscovery by Europeans around 1500 AD that the ground they walk on was already fertilized by the genius of Plato's Athens. It's, a, it's really a rediscovery by Europe of Europe's own ancient forgotten roots. Anyway, this is the standard story. Once standard story told about the Renaissance, I won't get into the recent critical um, historiography, but Here's another uh, kind of renaissance. Let me just clean this up a little bit. Okay. So <clears throat> here uh, we have a, a, a wider uh, time span going back to, let's say, 6,000 years ago. This is when linguists and anthropologists and historians uh, posit the existence of what they call the Proto-Indo-Europeans. And this is, by the name, you can see a group of people who uh, somehow cover both the Indian and the, and the European, a sort of pan-Eurasian people. And um, their discovery, the discovery that they existed, um, I'm going to date to around 230 years ago. This is when the first ancient Indian scripture was translated into a modern European language. I believe this was English, Wilkins' Bhagavad Gita, Bhag the Bhagavad Gita being the uh, one of the central texts of, of um, Indian religiosity. And <clears throat> this, is, this is one of the fruits, I think, of colonial contact that... Uh, uh, those in in the British Raj um, uh, took some interest. Some of them took some interest in the local culture and started to learn the local languages, including Sanskrit, and started to translate these these ancient texts into English and German and French, and realized that <clears throat> Sanskrit was an awful lot like Latin and German and English and other European languages. And maybe at first they thought this was a coincidence that in, in, in you know, like notice in Punjabi, you've got ek, do, teen for one, two, three. And in French, you've got en, deux, trois. And they sound awful similar. And you've got to start wondering, as, the, as these supposed coincidences start accumulating, you've, you've, you've got to explain it. And the, <clears throat> I mean, the, the short story is, We were led to posit a group of people, a let's say first linguistic group, whose whose tongue branched into the languages we now uh, call Sanskrit and German and English. That they have a common root. So this is uh, another Renaissance, right? This is the I call it the Indo-European Renaissance. This is the realization that uh, by Europeans that they have a deep common root. That's a little more Pan-Asian. And we can go further, let me clean this up again. <clears throat> we can go further and talk about the shamanic renaissance. And you can see the time scale um, I'm spanning here is huge. In fact, when we go to 40,000 years ago, we're talking about well before the advent of you know, civilization, civilization meaning city-based life. And uh, when we go back 40,000 years, we're, we're dipping into our uh, deep tribal past that is for most of our history as homo sapiens and then going back even further to our broader uh, primate existence we, we lived on a tribal scale we lived with a few dozen people whose names we knew and uh, and city life is is a new scaling up from that very recent and the shamanic renaissance is, is, is the realization that this figure, the shaman, has been with us going back deep into our history. I date the shamanic renaissance to 50 years ago. This was the uh, roughly the publication of Mircea Eliade's scholarly book on shamanism, on the shaman called Le Shamanisme, uh, Les Techniques Archaïques de l'Ecstasy. And this, this 
terrible pronunciation, but uh, the shaman and tech, uh, ancient techniques of ecstasy. The shaman by Eliad's subtitle here is the master of not polyphasia, but of ecstasy. But ecstasy literally means, if you trace it to its Greek roots, it means standing outside of yourself. So the shaman is someone by Eliad's subtitle who can who can get outside of his ordinary self. And uh, that's a polyphasic ability. So there's a nice continuity here between Eliad's characterization of the shaman and then um, John Hall's characterization, which is certainly building on the work of scholars like Eliad. So in, in, in this work, Eliad traces what he calls the shaman's path. This is The shaman is a sort of a cultural universal, according to Eliad, that you'll find by different names in, in various tribal cultures. But there's a similar set of characteristics you find in the shamans. For example, the shaman will go through an initiation, an initiatory ecstasy, where their body comes apart and is put back together. Notice the echoes of this in, for example, modern superhero origin stories. A lot of our superheroes become superheroes through some initially quite traumatic destruction of the original self or something which symbolizes the destruction of the original self. I mean, a lot of our modern lab-bred superheroes are laboratory accidents like Bruce Banner turning into the Hulk or even Peter Parker bit by the laboratory spider turning into Spider-Man. And this is these are these are echoes of the shamanic path where the shaman is a special member of the tribe who's marked for a special destiny. And uh, to become polyphasic, they need to they need to leave behind their old self and they gain a new identity uh, and with mastery over the ecstasy. So ecstasy happens to most of us once in a while. Uh, the shaman is a master of ecstasy. Uh, the shaman is the master of polyphasia. All of us dream. Uh, some of all of us will, uh, you know, if we take ayahuasca, certainly have a very powerful polyphasic experience. The shaman is the master of dreaming, is the master of uh, the psychedelic state. The shaman is someone who can <clears throat> map the dream world and then return to it. Um, um, sort of um, treat the dream world seriously as a possibly consistent world unto itself and remember it and return to it night after night and um, remember where they met that entity who wisely gave them advice the night before and return to it the next night in their dreaming. Uh, the, psych uh, the psychedelic master is one who will return from the ayahuasca journey with coherent memories of it and with condensed lessons from it that can be shared with the tribe. So it's not that the shaman has this superpower of ecstasy or um, polyphasia, which which we don't have at all. We're, we're all just, at least insofar as we dream, quite dramatically and regularly polyphasic. The shaman is the master of this. And anyone is shamanic who, who starts to take these states seriously and starts to um, study them and tries to integrate lessons across these states. Anyway, I'm not going to go through all these uh, points from Eliad, but uh, the the idea Eliad working in this sort of anthropological mode, um, comparative religion mode, is positing the shaman as a as a member of our tribe who's always been there and is is there in every tribe you take a close look at. <clears throat> No, I dated the, the shamanic renaissance to the publication of Eliad's book, but um, we can go back further to Hall, Hall talks about the contact of Avakum Petrovich, and this is a depiction of him in Siberia. He was banished to Siberia. This is the age old punishment inflicted upon Russians. And Avakum was very highly placed in the Russian Orthodox Church, almost at the Pope level, but uh, I guess had some heretical views and tendencies and was more than once banished to Siberia, eventually burnt at the stake. I think you can, you can double check that for me, but uh, um, eventually, I think, um, executed for his heresy. But on one of his banishments to Siberia, he made contact there with the Siberian indigenous peoples. And in fact, the word, the word shaman is the Siberian indigenous word for their local uh, version of the, the medicine man or the shaman, uh, the healer, the spirit guide. 
And Avakum there uh, has his own shamanic, his sort of um, inherent uh, shamanic tendencies, awoken by contact with a Siberian shaman. It's not a, exactly a benevolent contact. He enters into a kind of shamanic battle <laughs> um, with this Siberian shaman. The sh Siberian shaman makes a, a prognostication about a coming war. And Avakum feels within him the surging of a counterposition and makes the opposite prediction. And Avakum's prediction turns out to be correct. And so this is a kind of a awakening by sh contact uh, from one Siberian practice shaman to a burgeoning um, shaman of the shamanic impulse. It's a kind of remembering by Europe of its archaic shamanic roots. And uh, my soul saw that they would be massacred. He, he had the uh, uh, darker prognostication, but so here's a picture of Carl Jung, uh, who himself might be a, a kind of shaman-like figure. The, the, the psychotherapist is one like, like the Amazonian ayahuasca shaman who guides the participant in the therapeutic process into contact with, you know, other phases or modes of reality, often in the, in the case of 20th century psychotherapy with, with their dream life. So tell me about your dreams, Jung might say to the um, therapist. And Jung is the master of the dream world. Jung is someone who himself has studied his own dreams and made contact with putative entities in that dream world and has 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 gained wisdom about the archetypal uh, uh, reality disclosed in dream and myth and then can apply that or map that on to apparently mundane reality. And so Jung can guide you the, the therapist in his office into that kind of wisdom about your own life through through reading your own dreams. Jung was was thus a kind of shaman figure in the guise of modern medical um, therapy, and um, he was also interested theoretically in the in the shaman. He defined the shaman as the original model of the individuation process. Think of the the shamans. Um, initiatory ecstasy, which gives them a new, uh, a new identity, a unique identity, and the foundation of medical psychology, uh, the archaic form of prophecy, priesthood, philosophy, and religion. The shaman uh, has has his original home in the tribal scale, where there's much less division of labor, and so the shaman ends up taking on many of the occupations or roles which are now divided in mass civilization into um, separate occupations. So the pr prominent, uh, the shaman was this sort of mixed, uh, mixed class character was a bit of a, a, a healer, a bit of a prophet, a bit of a priest, a bit of a professor and, and so on. And then you can ask, you know, wh where is the shaman today? The shamanic renaissance does not mean that the shaman left and then reappeared in, in civilization after many hundreds or thousands of years of absence. It's that uh, perhaps the, the shaman has always been here, but took on um, um, an unfamiliar form. And we lost explicit awareness of the shaman and regained that only recently. So now we can now think about figures like the Argentinian author Borges or uh, the philosopher Ludwig Wittgenstein or the physicist Albert Einstein, Jung himself we've talked about, as, as having shamanic um, qualities, right? I mean, we don't have to say these are shaman, but they've got some qualities which, which ally them with some of the archetypal features of the shaman. Um, so here's, here's Einstein pursuing, uh, recounting his thought experiment at the age of 16 of pursuing a beam of light. And based on his very precise imagining of, of, of what he would see on catching up to this beam of light and moving alongside it, he, he, 
inferred uh, you know a, a contradiction with with Maxwell's accepted equations on electromagnetism. So um, from this very vivid imagining of his interaction with a beam of light, he eventually, I mean, this is the seed, as he says, of special relativity theory. This is the seed, this little imagined light beam ride, seeds of 20th century physics. And and so this is someone who's again we can speak in the in the language of the shaman's negotiation of different phases of experience this is a, a special being of the tribe who has traveled somewhere most of us cannot travel most of us can i mean we can close our eyes and imagine chasing a beam of light but we'll do it in a very cartoonish um simplified way which which will bear no rigorous implications for physical reality uh, but einstein does it with such precision it's like he's uh, hallucinating the actual thing i mean um i'm not supposing that einstein actually got to astrally leave his body uh, you know daydreaming in math class at his swiss school and chase a beam of light but in his imagination he constructed a realistic journey a sort of astral journey and uh return to the tribe eventually with once he worked it out uh epoch making knowledge so there's again some interesting similarity with the archetypal shamanic function uh, there's Jung. Jung himself, uh, as I said, analyzed his own dreams, and he had a particularly fruitful period uh, just in the years leading up to World War One, where he was, you know, especially, um, I think he would say, uh, suffering <laughs> visions, uh, many of them disturbing and apocalyptic, and uh, in his dream life and in his uh, even waking life, I think, making contact with these entities, many of which he depicted in what, what came to be called his Red Book. These are uh, images from his, his so-called Red Book, which is now available. Mm -hmm. And you can see these images Jung himself painted to, to record the contact he had made. And um, he called it the most important time of his life. These, I think it was around, around 1910. And the rest of his life, consisted in elaborating what had burst forth from the unconscious and flooded him in, in, that, in, in that time. When we talk about Philip K. Dick and his uh, 2374 experience, we'll see a similar thing where he's got this this very uh, active period in, in March, uh, February, March of 1974 of, of you know, polyphasic um, experience. And he spends the rest of his life, which is just eight more years, working out what had flooded his his consciousness. Temporal concerns draw people away from the timeless foundational reality of the myth, and it's the shaman's duty to restore the connection. The shaman, again, is a master of polyphasia, and temporal concerns, or our day-to-day -day concerns, the concerns that are marked in our you know, Google schedule on our smartphone, um, occupy us and draw us away from a different reality, the archetypal reality that people like Jung um, mapped for us. And the shaman's duty is to remind us of this other reality and to help us make connections across uh, the, the apparent boundary between the archetypal or mythical reality and uh, our day to day reality to, I mean, keep to our schedule and keep our appointments and, um, you know, pay our bills, maybe, but uh, understand if not everything we do, a lot of what we do in the light of a, a deeper archetypal um, uh, reality. And an advanced shaman would be polyphasic, not just in moving back and forth between temporal, um, ordinary reality and these stranger realities revealed in dreams and psychedelia, but maybe uh, uh, someone who's somewhat permanently fixed one foot in the daily reality and the other foot in the polyphasic reality, that they're polyphasic radically by being in both realities constantly. 
And a shaman in that mode might develop a very interesting way of talking. <laughs> they might develop an efficient form of communication where they're, whatever they're saying is, is about both realities at once. And so if you're, if you're totally ignorant of, the, of, of anything beyond the day-to-day -day reality and you talk to the shaman, it might sound like you're just making small talk. You're just talking about the weather and about um, your career. Um, but the shaman is, is speaking in this sort of coded way or this bivalent way, which is also saying something about the story, the capital S story that you're a character in. And the shaman is trying to give you maybe some wisdom about who you are. I had an interesting encounter about 10 years ago, 20, well, you can see 2009 AD, the, 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 the sort of Starbucks shaman uh, left me with a, a square piece of paper with a uh, perfect circle on it and his email address. And I noted afterwards, oh, he dated it 22nd of June, 2009 AD. And that's just a nice, um, polyphasic way of talking about the current day. It's, it's, it's the AD, the Anno Domini in the year of our Lord reminds us of the archetypal um, dimension of our calendar. With practice, every incident in life is instantaneously appreciated for its mythic significance. Ideally, the experienced shaman lives in mythscape all the time and when you talk to the shaman listen carefully because he's telling you something about your life when luke skywalker meets obi-wan kenobi obi-wan kenobi can tell luke you are the hero and the, you're in a saint george and the dragon story and you are meant to draw the, so the sword from the stone and slay the dragon that's who you are and by the way, here's here's your sword. Your dad left it to you. There's this, um, um, you know, the shaman, like the wise old man. The wise old man is, is is a variation, or the shaman is a variation on the wise old man archetype. Perhaps the shaman can help you understand who you are in its deepest sense and help orient you in the the story that is is your life. Well, without, without a lineage and an elder to initiate you, if you had shamanic inclinations in a culture which has lost touch with its shamanic archetype, you might be plunged into a kind of hellish extended confusion and you'd have to find your way a little bit through through uh, that ex that extended initiation on your own. So we'll talk about Philip K. Dick now and what happened to him in the 1970s. But um, you can think of him again as this shamanic figure who had to find his way um, through this, through this painful destruction and reconstruction. I don't want to say on his own. He was guided by elders, but often these elders were in the form of other books. He turned to the ancient philosophical tradition. He turned to disciplines of psychology and theology and others to, to find some guidance in these words for his own experience. Sci-fi imagines in 1901 the first man on the moon, and in less than 70 years, it's it's fact. So the phi has actually behaved as a kind of prediction or prophecy. I mean, at its at its best, science fiction is not pure fantasy it's fantasy or the imagination guided by a uh, plausible scientific inference or um, extrapolations from the trends in 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 science current to the author um, often into the future or extrapolations into uh, sort of an alternate um, universe 
Sai Fi, June 1950, and by, you know, the 1970s, this picture depicts a man at a full synthesizer sequencer station. Indeed, <clears throat> the imagined possibility of a single, uh, you know, digital age Mozart or punch tape age Mozart um, composing at, at a single workstation and, and outputting, performing, I think, uh, uh, you know, uh, symphonic scale work. This, this is realized uh, within a couple of decades. Uh, so again, science fiction um, uh, predicts often, sometimes luckily, sometimes again by by wise inference of the author, uh, future future trends. Now, this is an interesting way of thinking about what happens <clears throat> to Philip K. Dick in 1974. He has a revelatory experience. By calling it a revelatory experience, I'm not. Uh, yet implying anything about its uh, its uh, you know ontological uh, status but uh, but <clears throat> for a couple of decades uh, leading up to 74 dick had been writing science fiction many many novels and uh, uh, short stories many of which had this similar story time out of joint is typical it's a story of a man, a fairly ordinary man, who, who is actually living in a kind of illusory, uh, artificial reality that has been constructed around him by uh, powers uh, outside his ken. And the, the the great action of the novel is 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 epistemological. It's the revelation, sometimes slow, sometimes fast, of the protagonist. <clears throat> their awakening to the artificiality of their world and the breaking through of the reality behind that, often a disturbing reality. Often there's a mission implied in that revelation that that in learning about the new world, the, uh, the protagonist is given a kind of mission. There's something that needs to be corrected. And in 1974, Dick will, will, for his remaining eight years of life, he dies in 1982, he'll call this his 2374 experience or February, March. 74 was, was really the uh, center climax of um, escalating revelations that had been plaguing him and intriguing him. Uh, leading up to 74. Uh, it's not a single revelation. It's, it's, it's a number of, I mean, uh, a large number of revelatory moments and, and dreams and waking life. Uh, but he, he often talks about this this day in February when the pharmacy delivery girl knocked on his door, bringing healing news, bringing um, in mundane reality uh, medicine that he had ordered uh, painkillers to help him with his recovery from uh, dental surgery he'd undergone, I think, I think that very day. But <clears throat> he receives a flash as he's talking to this girl at the door. He receives a, just this flash of, of insight, of a deep perception into the true nature behind the mundane reality. So here's the mundane reality of, of slightly schlubby Philip K. Dick answering the door and light literally and uh, maybe metaphorically um, hits this fish pendant, the ichthus Christian pendant. Here it is, head on. And the light literally and as it were hits him in the eye and gives him a flash of the true situation behind mundane uh, California 1974. They are actually um, in biblical times and she is bringing the gospel news of the return of the Messiah the promised return of the, uh, of the salvational king. And th these are secret Christians. <clears throat> the ichthus was in fact a symbol of the early, slightly more secretive church. And they are secret Christians now rejoicing in the healing, healing gospel or good, good, good news. 
So by side fact, uh, you know, I I won't imply that uh, this situation, as Dick describes it, is 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 the the factual one. Uh, it's in fact Dick himself will spend the rest of his life uh, getting different angles on these experiences and reinterpreting them, and it was, with often great skeptical acumen. Um, Dick himself, I think, would question the appropriateness of this this term to describe his experience, but. But in any case, Dick will, you know, in the years he spends obsessively after this experience, uh, writing about it and trying to understand it, um, one view he'll come to is that he had been predicting this, this revelation in his decades of science fictional writing that uh, that the reason he was so obsessed with this story of uh, of a dramatic epistemic shift in a protagonist's uh, worldview is that the the wiser uh, creative more prophetic part of himself as he was writing these stories in the 50s and 60s uh, knew that this was coming to him, that he was obsessed with this story because the, the deepest part of him, the uh, the part that wasn't sleeping, knew that this would be the great event of his life. Uh, so Dick saw his own sci-fi as a kind of personal prophecy of his own uh, coming to his prophetic mission. He'll call uh, his experience many things, as I said, but he rather likes this Greek term anamnesis, which if, if you break it down, you see it means the opposite of amnesia. So amnesia is total forgetting, uh, not just I forgot where I left my keys, but I, I forget who I am. And uh, so inversely, anamnesis is total remembering, not just, um, oh, I remember where I kept my keys, but I now know who I am. I know why I'm here. I know my deep history not just not just the uh the immediacy and and in in, in the larger scope of of his deep self uh, his current incarnation as philip k dick born in the 1920s and i think he was born in chicago and um and the science fiction writer uh, with a cult following and some awards under his belt that's all part of his very local amnesic <laughs> self-understanding and in 74 He's given a dramatic opening up to uh, the deeper, the deeper Philip K. Dick, uh, which probably shouldn't go by the name Philip K. Dick anymore. He'll talk about his ancient self as being the ancient, the ancient Thomas. So here's a sample page from the exegesis, uh, which is the traditional theologic term for a you know commentary and interpretation on biblical revelation on 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 scripture and dick uses this term to describe his own written attempts to comprehend his own 1974 centered religious awakening uh see here again one of his science fictional works, we can remember it for you wholesale. This this was turned into the Hollywood film with it's the title Total Recall. Uh, it was it was converted twice, once in 1990, starring Arnold Schwarzenegger, and once about ten years ago, starring Colin uh, Colin Colin what's his name? <laughs> and uh, uh, Total Recall is actually a pretty good. Uh, translation of Dick's original title, uh, both uh, remembering wholesale and total recall mean an amnesis. So I think Dick in in and after 74 could look back on his own title choice in 1966 or whatever it was he composed that particular story and say he was he was fumbling towards the Greek term and uh, an amnesia and he was through the working out of these stories ahead of his experience trying to trying to comprehend it so his his pre-74 science fictional work is an attempt through the language of fiction to um, 
understand what will happen to him in 1974. And then from 74 to 82, he's, he's doing this. He's also writing science fiction, uh, s- some of which d- directly incorporates, even quotes from his exegesis. But, but after 74, he's, he's more explicitly trying to understand his, his revelation. The exegesis is a pretty wild, varied work. There's, it's, it's, it's a bit of a, you know, kitchen sink of, uh, of Dick's mind. Uh, there, there are a couple of questions he's obsessed with and returns to again and again. I mean, the, the, he's driven, he's manically, uh, graphomaniacally writing uh, night and day, I think mainly at nights, um, to his dying day. And this obsession is driven by a few key questions. I mean, he's trying to understand what happened to him. And what is it is one of the recurring questions. And then why me? So what is this thing that has contacted me, right? I mean, I've been contacted. I've received a signal. What is the signal? What is its source? And why me? Why, I mean, has this extraordinary signal reached me? Why didn't it hit my... Uh, neighbor in the apartment next door. Why didn't it? Why did it not come to Ursula Le Guin, my uh, fellow science fiction writer? Uh, so uh, these are these are good questions. In fact, these are the two questions that anyone who receives uh, the signal on the mountaintop should uh, should ask very carefully. Uh, Dick's exegesis is, uh, is is you can think of it as I don't know if postmodern is the right word, but it's. It's got some of the qualities we associate with postmodernism, this kind of critical consciousness that is prone to self-reflection, um, almost infinitely recursive self-reflection, and is also willing to think of a thing on multiple angles. And, and, and you know, the postmodern consciousness is maybe hesitant to settle on any one angle as the authoritative one. And and Dick has this kind of approach to his own revelation where through the exegesis, we can track it chronologically um, from 74 to 82. And we see that he, he doesn't really settle on a final interpretation of what happened to him. He doesn't settle on a final interpretation of, 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 of these these questions, uh, though he does uh, sort of, uh, I mean, if you add up his answers, they, 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 you can maybe find some dominant trends, some favored approaches to these questions. But, uh, but he's, he's writing manically to his dying day. And there, there are moments, tragicomic moments in the exegesis where he, 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 he's writing and he, he's announcing that he's figured it all out and that he's done. I mean, you can find entries from 77 or 78 where he says, at last I've found it. I've arrived at the answer. Here it is. Here's the final statement of it. And I can now put my pen down and, and, um, and, and relax from my manic mission. But the, the next day or the next week, you see another dated entry and he's back at it again. But what is it and, and why me? Let's see. Uh, something of, of the answers that Dick proposed to these. God in the trash stratum, or the same idea, reveals in the figurants, the figurants in scene craft are the background characters. And the trash stratum, if you think about uh, the archaeology of a city, the trash stratum would be the lowest layer, literally perhaps, where all the waste of the civilization filters down to and collects, uh, and figuratively the the lowest layer, the ignored layer, the alley, the gutter, the uh, trash heap. These are the trash stratum is what society is precisely uninterested in. And that's why it's trash. And so this is a provocative idea that you'd be most likely to find the divine in that, that which is ignored. Again, the same idea that the, the revelation 
the salvational knowledge will be among the figurants, will be not in, in, in Cary Grant's performance, uh, but maybe in one of the background characters. In fact, here, if you look at this little guy, this extra, I don't even know if he was paid for his time on the set that day, but he's got his, his ears plugged and uh, she's just about to shoot him. And he knows he's a prophet relative to the North by Northwest narrative. He's a prophet and revealing his prophetic awareness of the gunshot to come um, by plugging his ears. Uh, this is probably take 17 in a long day of, of production. And the kid knows the cue, knows the line, which means the cap gun is about to go off. And at this point, his ears are weary. <laughs> he's, he's, he's a figurant. He's a background character. When you're watching the movie, you're not supposed to be paying attention to him. And perhaps Hitchcock and, and his editor didn't, didn't pay attention either and didn't, didn't notice this gaffe, which really reveals to the viewer, if, if you're watching him and not, and, you know, and, and, and not the stars, you'll be taken out of the, of the movie as absorbed as you were in, in the narrative. You now remember, ah, oh, this is, this is just a movie. It's all a production. And as many people as we see here, there are probably just as many or more people off screen holding boom mics and running cameras and setting up catering tables. This is all a big, production it's it's an artificial world so the the revelation that we're in an artificial world according to dick is most likely to come if you pay attention to that world's discarded information and you pay attention to the background characters the extras just aren't as into this world <laughs> cary grant is hired and admired because he's very good at drawing the audience in by the intensity of his performance, let's say any any good actor gets so into their role that they start to believe it while the camera is running and they draw the audience in to their reality warping. And the audience, uh, you know, can be transported away from ordinary reality into this artificial world. The extras aren't accomplished actors and they're just not as into the whole production either. They're there maybe to um, um, collect a collect a tiny paycheck, and and so if you pay attention to them, you'll be presented with 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 the truth of the situation. Davis calls this this advice from Dick to pay attention to the to the discarded information. He calls this liberation info theology, a uh, theological technique that promises liberation through through the proper relationship to information. So we're we're in an artificial world at, at his darkest dick characterizes this as a black iron prison that our reality has a prison structure um it's uh, limiting our freedom and our happiness and it's a subtle powerful prison powerful because it's subtle um, because we don't realize it's a prison, we don't even try to escape it. The most powerful bars are the ones you don't see. <clears throat> and the black iron prison keeps us in its thrall. And Dick contrasts that with the place of freedom, which revelation awakens you to. That's the palm tree garden. This is very Christian. Um, I mean, it's really the palm tree garden takes us to the Levant. And it's, it's, uh, you know, uh, local vision of, of heaven. And the black iron prison is a sort of idea from Gnosticism, really. For the Gnostic, the prison is not just um, the oppressive U.S. Um, hegemony of the, of the global order. The prison is physical reality itself that, 
your your physicality is the ultimate prison. You think your body and the healthy body gives you freedom to move, but if you could really see the the, the the total situation, you'd see the body is limiting your soul, it's imprisoning your soul, which could otherwise fly with complete freedom. Uh, so what is it and and why me these two questions dick obsesses with one of the answers to why me that he proposes and rather likes is that he's prone to to question things and you can see that reflected here in the in the sort of childlike question that's the title of one of his best known works do androids dream of electric sheep it's it sounds like a very naive question it's a it's a question you might ask before you've really investigated uh, ai and cognitive science and robotics and philosophy of mind it's also a question you might emerge with at the end of that investigation <laughs> you might think that this is actually an excellent uh, question to hang on to um, and uh, you know childlike questions are often indistinguishable from philosophically wise questions dick says that he's he, he realized after 74 especially that he's always had this propensity going back to his earliest childhood memories of of, of, of asking strange deep questions and persisting with them that th th there was i guess again the, the wiser awakened part of his even child soul which didn't accept reality as it was given to him dick dick will will say that he remembered he he wouldn't just stare at a wall he wouldn't just look at the wall he'd always be trying to look through it at the same time to the point where you know how do i know my, uh, my color blue is the same as your color blue it took dick a while to realize that when other people are looking at walls and and if you ask them what are you doing they say i'm looking at a wall it took dick a while to realize that for him that experience always contained a good measure of trying to pierce through the occluding given reality um, so why me well uh <laughs> the answer is implied in the very question or the act of questioning i'm i'm prone to question even after i'm given revelation i'm asking questions and that's that's the answer to to why me perhaps thinking again of of this technique of uh, guerrilla info theology as davis calls it you pay attention to the marginal information i think i think dick always had this tendency too and <laughs> this might be a slightly self-serving answer too uh, i mean dick, dick's got a good measure of the narcissist in him too it's, it's often a very lovable childish narcissism but but you could see there's there's a self-serving element in his in his idea that one who wants revelation should pay attention to marginal information because relative to the you, you know the, the literary canon of 20th century great literature dick's work certainly at the time he was writing was considered quite marginal i mean his his literary reputation has has changed since he died but at the time dick was writing science fiction was was this uh, sort of cultish marginal um subgenre with with very little uh, respect uh, it wasn't winning any nobel prizes it had to make up its own prizes some of which dick himself won but his prestige was very much limited to to a, a small group of science fiction aficionados and dick dick's i guess i mean he he had great respect for the the canon he after 74 he he devoted a lot of energy to to pouring through the great works of the western philosophical and literary canon uh, seeking parallels to his own experience seeking answers to his questions but he he always maintained this love for marginal pop kitsch uh, uh pulp um production and 
thinking of the Black Iron Prison, uh, important information will be hard to get into the prison, to get to the prisoners, to wake them up. And uh, someone outside of the prison who wants to help the prisoners escape will have to choose their channels of communication very carefully. Uh, one of the uh, almost cliched ways, at least in prison movies, of getting in for smuggling contraband into the prison is through the, the, the trash channels, literally through the garbage chute uh, or smuggled in and out of the laundry cart. Um, so the the main gate is watched very closely by the archons, by the powers and principalities of the prison. But liberating information can enter through the um, ignored channels. So again, you're more likely. I mean, by this tactic of guerrilla information theology, you're more likely to find revelatory information in a ten cent comic book. Then, well, I don't want to say the pages of the Bible themselves, but but uh, uh, then, you know, uh, uh, Tavangeli broadcast on a Sunday morning on a on network television, let's say. Here's the original red pill situation. Uh, Quaid, the Dickian protagonist, is being offered a red pill, which is, is according to this psychiatrist, the reality principle. If, 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 if Quaid will eat the red pill, he'll signal his assent to his own confused consciousness that he's willing to rejoin reality and be woken from his delusions. Now, in this, in this scene, Total Recall, the psychiatrist is is actually this is very late in the drama is telling Quaid that what Quaid thought was his awakening was in fact a descent into a psychotic delusion and the psychiatrist is warning Quaid that your time is just about up that in reality you are, you know, foaming at the mouth and insane, and we're about to unplug you. Uh, in your mind, the psychiatrist says, you're an interplanetary secret agent about to save all of Earth and Mars. This is, is the question that uh, Quaid has to confront and hopefully solve. And this is the question that Dick, in his own terms, is dealing with after 74. Am, am I the recipient of a divine revelation or am I in a deep delusion? Am I in an out of control ego trip? Am I just being carried away by my science fictional imagination? Am I suffering a lurid schizophrenic episode? Have I projected the theophany? Uh, did I do too many amphetamines in the 50s and 60s when I was um, staying up all night or staying up for a week at a time, pumping out my fifth novel of that year to put bread on the table? Um, Dick <laughs> almost preemptively, uh, defensively has taken care of all the skeptical angles you might pose to him. So you might say to Dick, well, what if it's just, you know, you fried your brains through drug abuse? Dick himself has already thought this through and never quite abandons these these factors. His revelation is complex and maybe expectedly the causes feeding into that revelation are complex. Um, it could be not Either you saw God or you did too many drugs and are schizophrenic. It could be you saw God and you're schizophrenic and did a lot of drugs. It could be that because God is marginal relative to the Black Iron Prison, God himself has been you know, exiled by an imposter, imposter God that the Gnostics called Yaldabaoth. Because God himself has been exiled, um, God maybe can only appear to those who've been marginalized, those who've been 
taken outside of the, the, the Black Iron Prison's master narrative. And it may be that schizophrenia and drug abuse are the admittedly imperfect, but um, they're among the ways you can be um, jarred out of um, the oppressive narrative and uh, broken down and made receptive to revelatory um, signals. At the center of psychosis, I encountered her, beautiful and kind, and most of all, wise. This is uh, Pallas Athena, matron deity of Athens, of Greek genius and culture, and the Greek goddess of wisdom, Dick at his most optimistic, sees his experience as, yes, um, crazy and confusing and painful, but it was, it was a necessary process he underwent. And remember the shamanic journey through painful, destructive initiation we've talked about. Dick's journey into the calm center, the omphalos, or the navel of reality of harmony and calm. There's this very interesting feminine presence um, in the exegesis and Dick's experience, maybe at the center of it, as he says here. Dick begins the exegesis as a series of letters to a number of people, but uh, many of the significant early letters, which, which are part of the exegesis now, uh, are to uh, Claudia Bush. This was a young graduate student who was doing what must have been, if not the first, one of the very first graduate theses on, on the work of Philip K. Dick on science fiction. And I think she wrote to Dick, as, as I said, science fiction was a small enough <laughs> uh, genre that you could probably uh, write, just pick up a pen and write to Dick, and he'd, he'd be very likely to write back, partly because he was uh, you know, a lonely, graphomaniacal guy, but interesting to think about the exegesis as, as beginning in letters to Claudia and, and maybe throughout being a kind of series of confusing letters, maybe love letters to this feminine wisdom figure. He'll talk about in his in his uh, sort of auditory hallucinations or revelations of, of a voice that would literally speak. Some of these some of these revelations were literally a voice that would come to him, often at the boundary between wake and sleep. This hypnagogic voice, and one one of the voices. I mean, there was a cast of characters. This sort of polytheistic ecosystem of entities who would communicate to him. But one of the dominant figures of that of that ecosystem is what he called the feminine AI. This is uh, both ancient and futuristic. It's, it's, it's the voice you might actually give to Athena. Athena is a virgin goddess and um, part of her uh, intellectual power, I think, comes from her cool remove from the passions of life. She's the gray-eyed Athena. And it's also this this coolness is, is a quality we associate in that uncanny valley with our current AI voices. Um, yeah, I guess it's a little there in Siri. I think when I think of the feminine AI voice, I think of the TTC uh, voice, which I assume is, is uh, computer generated. It's feminine. And it's a little bit cool, but it's it's helpful. It sounds like you know a bit of the stereotype of the the librarian who's a bit cool in her intercourse with you, but she's helpful. She does want to help. She you you approach her um, in the right spirit. You want the right book. You're seeking wisdom, and you ask her, and she will. She won't get excited, and she won't be your friend, and she won't meet you for coffee after, but she will. Uh, 
she will help you find that book you need. This is, this is, these are some of the sort of personality traits we associate with the Athena archetype, I think. And Dick is in an interaction with this feminine presence through the, through this eight year experience. And, uh, you know, of course, just like we could say, well, he saw God or he did too many drugs and had a history of psychosis. We can say he was making his approach of this Greek wisdom goddess, or we could say he was a lonely old guy and um, um, seeking feminine company. Well, we could say it was both that that because of his problematic relations with human females, he he was more motivated to seek a different kind of feminine presence. And what, one of the classic heretical Gnostic ideas is the idea that this this black iron prison of physical reality, which you know, for the Gnostics, we are, we are the prisoners in Plato's cave. We are um, watching the shadows and mistaking them for reality. And the shadows are what we call physical reality. And physical reality is, is, is therefore the prison or the illusion. And it's God is, according to the Gnostics, the one identified in the Old Testament as, as Yahweh. Or many of the passages starring Yahweh in the Old Testament or the Jewish record are the communications of, of an entity, but not the true divine entity there. Uh, in other words, this, this heretical Gnostic idea is that um, the Bible is a record of human interaction with, in many of its parts, a false God. And this is the God that, as Dick says, um, bellows, curses, and rants. I am the Lord, and that is my name, and my glory will I not give to another. This is this is how Yahweh often speaks, and, and it's a little disturbing. I mean, I think I think Judeo-Christian theology needs to account for Yahweh's problematic jealousy and narcissism and uh, monomania. And the Gnostic answer to that is 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 that this is not God. That this this bellowing being is is a false entity who maybe himself is in a state of profound anamnesia. He maybe truly thinks he is is the true God. Uh, he's honest, uh, but deluded. He he has suppressed or forgotten the fact that he usurped the throne of heaven from the true God. He's like Hamlet's uncle Claudius, who's forgotten forgotten how he became um, king of Denmark. And the true creator, says Dick, is mild and gentle and loving. Right? This voice seems almost feminine. No, this was some... English folk protesting, I think it was the expansion of an airport into the, into the English commons, onto the village green, and they're signaling their displeasure, their unwillingness to go along with this um, Borg-like expansion of the technologic matrix into the, into the uh, pastoral utopia. No. To the to the people taking off in the planes, but but also to the sky. This is uh, it's a nice image of what Dick calls balking or deeply rebelling. Just like just like anamnesis is deep remembering, balking is a deep kind of um, disobedience, uh, refusal to go along with with the dictates of the Black Iron Prison. Um, and in, in balking, you're signaling to your deeper self, you're signaling maybe to benevolent powers who are outside of the prison structure, 
that you are ready for the revelatory information, right? This revelatory information is so, so disruptive and so counter to our deepest, our deepest in, indoctrination within the prison that it's, it, it, it's very hard to believe and therefore receive even when it's told to you. So that that revelatory information is actually wasted on those who aren't ready for it. Those who aren't ready for it will at best laugh at it or ignore it. But more dangerously for those who'd like to like to liberate prisoners, um, prisoners who receive the, the revelation and aren't ready for it could do dangerous things with that, with that information um, could, could tell on, <laughs> The source uh, um, could give up a rat on the signal sender to to the archons. So it's essential that the person on his own initially rebel. You've got you've got to signal to the sky that uh, you're ready, and say no. You've got to figure out a way. Once once you've sensed that your reality is artificial, once you've got that sense, and it's persisted, and uh, almost as as a scientific test of this hypothesis, you you bulk and you see what response you receive from that from that bulking. 